Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, as always, joined by Joe Resinello. And once more, dear brothers and sisters, let us go into the breach on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. Two things, please download the app, share it with your friends. You'll have access to all of our station's content. Uh, and if you like what Joe and I do, we go live every Thursday night, 9 o'clock Eastern time on social media. Uh, so you could support us there rumble x youtube facebook the whole nine yards you know the drill like subscribe share do all that fun stuff today fun stuff today we're very pleased and honored to be joined by father greg markey and father has uh has written a book that's out from sophia press discovering the camino de santiago in fact it's funny because uh, Joe and I, the first one of the only pilgrimages I think I ever went on in my life uh, was at the Joe asked me to go on a pilgrimage from Joe. Where was it from? It was uh, West uh, Jersey to Doylestown, Doylestown, Our Lady of Chesterhova Shrine. It was like 50 miles from uh, New Jersey into Pennsylvania. It was really yeah, quite frankly, at that point, I, I didn't even know Catholics did pilgrimages. But, you know, and Joe was the one who originally told me about the Camino de Santiago. Uh, and I'm going to learn a lot more about it. Today, so we want to thank Father Greg Markey for coming on the show uh, to discuss this. Father, just so everybody knows, Father Markey uh, was ordained a priest for the Diocese of Bridgeport in 1999. He is currently the head chaplain of St. Thomas Aquinas College in Northfield, Massachusetts. Father Markey, welcome to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe and Joe, great to be with you. Thank you for having me on your show today. No, Good it's to an absolute pleasure. Like I said, we're going to learn a lot. I, well. I'm going to, I'm going to speak for myself. I'm going to learn a lot today. Uh, and uh, so uh, we're looking forward to a great conversation. Joe, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you. Father, would you lead us in prayer, please? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get together. You have told us that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are present. We humbly ask your blessings on our conversation today. May it be for your greater glory. May it move hard to love you with a deeper passion. And as we prepare for the coming mysteries of our Lord Jesus's passion, death and resurrection, help us to follow with our lady and always be faithful to everything that our Lord asks of us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now in the hour of our death, amen. amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, Father, let's jump right in in case people don't know uh, what the Camino is all about, the Camino de Santiago. It's in Spain. Tell us a little bit about it. Give us some historic perspective, because also, I mean, for those who may not know, uh, this has been going on for quite some time, um, also known as the Way of St. James. So there's a lot of history here. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, it's a it's. One of the oldest pilgrimages in the history of the church going on, as you say, for some time, thousands of years. After the pilgrimage to Rome and Jerusalem, it's the uh, most popular of the ancient pilgrimages in the history of the church. And it all is uh, ordered towards the tomb of St. James, the apostle, St. James the Greater. And he was the first martyr of the 12 apostles, which is recorded in Acts chapter 12. And the history basically is that he, uh, after Pentecost, he went out to the ends of the earth. Our Lord had commanded the apostles to go to the ends of the earth. His mission was to go to the ends of the earth as they knew it, then the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal and Spain. And there he went and preached the gospel, uh, ordained the first bishops there, and then returned to Jerusalem where he was martyred. He was uh, beheaded by Herod. His disciples, as the tradition tells us, took his body back to Spain and buried him there. And then during the collapse of the Roman Empire and the invasion of the Muslims in the 700s through the Iberian Peninsula, the devotion and the tomb got lost um, as the, the Catholics retreated north up into France and further and further north to avoid the Muslim invaders. Um, but as the Reconquista uh, went back and started to push the Muslims south, um, there was a revelation to some shepherds of his body. And already at that time in Spain, they were uh, talking about and praying and singing songs about how St. James was the great evangelist of that area. And that he, they knew that their ancient Christian roots were tied back to St. James. So then when his body was rediscovered, 
they recognized, yes, this is our roots. And then it, that was the early 800s, 9th century, 800s, that his body was rediscovered. And um, instantly at that point, pilgrims started to travel in from all over Europe. Miracles began to occur. And ever since that time, since the early 800s, there have been pilgrims coming from all over Europe and today from all over the world. So um, a wonderful, wonderful pilgrimage site and very much rooted in our Catholic faith. Let me just so expand you... on that for a second. Go ahead, Joe. Oh. Shrines attract the faithful. Um, a shrine that my wife and I have gone to a number of times, Joe and his wife came with us once, is uh, up in Montreal for St. Joseph, the oratory. Yeah. Largest shrine of St. Joseph in the world. Sadly, orders kind of ebb and flow. Um, sometimes dioceses have some issues. But shrines always attract the faithful. I always say to my wife, like, if if the United States collapsed, I would live next to a shrine. Because the shrine always attracts the faithful. Always attracts the faithful. Unlike anything else, because I have seen this with my own eyes, people always are attracted to shrines. Why is that? Because like to your to your point, like here you have people. I mean, it, it, in, in a sense, it makes no sense. But in a sense, it makes all the sense in the world. St. James, James is gone, but they're going to where, you know, they're making a, a journey to where he's buried. I mean, like. And that goes on to this very day. St. James, he's been dead for 2,000 years. People are still doing it. I mean, like, this is not, uh, they don't do that for Yogi Berra, Father. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, that, they're not going to Yogi Berra's tomb. They're going to St. James. <laughs> Tell us about that. Yeah, well, I think they're going because they're, that they can have their prayers answered there. Um, it would be, sometimes in history, it was the case that, they would be doing penance for their sins. And it was, if you can imagine, you're going to confession one Saturday afternoon at your local parish, and at the end of the confession, the priest says, uh, for your penance, walk to the tomb of St. James uh, for 500 miles. Um, that kind of thing happened in history where it was part of the penance of sins. You needed to go a pilgrimage on somewhere, to somewhere, to a saint's tomb. And of course, then reparation for sins, or to have a prayer answered, and thanksgiving for gifts given, uh, promises to be kept. Uh, one of the faithful says, I'm going to promise God something, and uh, I, and I, as part of that promise, I'm going to go to a pilgrimage to the tomb. Um, this is all part of having prayers answered, and and in the doing so also, then it uh, it, it contributes to culture and, and, and builds up the body of Christ. Absolutely. If you're just joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe, Joe Pasillo, Joe Racinello, we're way in the breach with Father Greg Markey. We're discussing his new book, Discovering the Camino de Santiago. Now, Father, that's available at Sophia Press. And of course, we always encourage our audience members. We're going to post the link in the description so that folks can go and get a discount from Sophia. But just in case, where else can our audience uh, purchase the book, Father? Well, I think it's going to be available on, of course, Amazon as well, and any of the major distributors, it'll be out there as well. Sophia is pretty much all, all over the place now. You can get all their books at any major outlet. Um, they're pretty good at getting their books out there. Cool. Thanks for that, Father. And we, uh, we always encourage our audience members to buy the book from the publishers. Uh, it, but if you got to go ahead, buy it from Amazon. But we would prefer that you... I totally agree. Go right to the publisher. Don't, guys. <laughs> right I, I hesitated publisher. even mentioning Amazon. I, do the, I don't try to give them any time. And I always say, don't buy it from Amazon. They're not our friends. Well, they, this is true. That's it. Father, that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> we'll have you back for that one. Now, Father, here's the thing. This is not this is not an easy pilgrimage. And like I said, I, I did I did one with Joe from uh, West Jersey to Doylestown, Our Lady of Chestahova. I, I found it to be. And again, I'm not out of shape, but I'm not exactly in shape. All right. And that was like a three or four day pilgrimage. And I would Joe and I joined, I think, the last couple days. All right. Um, this is a long journey. Now, you've done it. Correct me if I'm wrong. You've done it once. Am I right? Correct. Or have you done it more? Once no, one I've, time. I've done it twice. Once on uh, by by bus and by flying over there and by bus leading a pilgrimage uh, group over there. Uh, but then I've also walked it. The book is is about the five hundred mile walk. 
All right, so let me let me see if I can put this in some sort of contest, not just to say, hey, what made you do it? The pilgrimages have always been important to Catholics. I mean, there, I mean, when the reason for the first crusade was because pilgrimage routes uh, were being blocked to the to to the holy or one of the reasons to the Holy Land um, for those European Christians that wanted to go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. These are not easy things to do. There's something very there's something very deep spiritually in your soul that's happening when you go on a pilgrimage. Talk about that aspect of it. And also what, what was the driving force behind you going on this pilgrimage? Yeah. The driving force behind my going was in Thanksgiving for my priesthood. I was celebrating an anniversary at the time. And I said, I'd like to do this. I had been living with a, my pastor. My first pastor was a Spaniard and he had done it as a young priest and, and was very familiar with it. So I had talked about it over dinner numerous times with him. And so when I had the chance for a sabbatical, I said, I think I'm going to walk this and I want to do it in Thanksgiving. And so I planned it out and um, did got, got all the, the, the speculative aspects of it all taken care of. And I walked it. And there, you're right. There are a lot of hardships uh, with your feet and with unexpected troubles and uh inconveniences along the way there are hardships but that's all part of it because in that way you're, you're banding yourself to god and you get to actually see god's invisible hand uh taking care of you in ways that you hadn't expected that's part of the joy and 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 wonder of the pilgrimage is recognizing that god's ultimately in control uh during the pilgrimage and the the hardships are uh, add to the 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 recognition that i'm not in control of my life uh, there are bigger other factors, and I learned, learned to accept those hardships in my life, and I offer this up in reparation for my sins. It, 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 yeah, I, I mean, when I think about it, I wonder if, if, if you know, like you said, there's hardships, uh, there's the physical, you know, the, the, the physical um, beat, beating up, basically, you know, on your feet and your back and stuff like that. It's very difficult, and maybe, Father, you could comment on this. We have a hard enough time trusting in God with, things that aren't altogether painful or, or where you have to go through some sort of a trial. Um, nowadays, I think, I don't think that's a judgmental on my part. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm guilty of it. Um, where th th the idea of abandoning ourselves. I mean, I, I, I spent some time with the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal up in the, up in the Bronx before I got married. I was actually living up there for the f few months before I got married. And I met, uh, 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 he had an impact on me. He was a Jesuit. He was a real estate broker from Chicago who uh, joined the Jesuits. And part of what he had to do was he had to just he left, had to leave with thirty five dollars in his pocket and he just had to go and trust God. And the reason why I bring that up is I'm tying it into to, to this trust that you're talking about. Most people have a hard time with that. I was in awe of this this young man because he actually did it and he trusted in God and God was guiding him all the way along the way. Um, talk about the need for that. That 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 perhaps on, on, we we need as as a family as a Catholic family to abandon ourselves more to God's trust because we trust in too many things in this world. Yeah, we do think that we can control things, and we think that there's a sense of what we'd say is Pelagianism that I can will these things for myself, or I can control the events in my life. When ultimately we can't. I mean, but I don't know. You two are both. Uh, are you you two both are married and have kids? Yeah, we're married to two. We're married to sisters, two Haitian sisters. Oh, that's sisters. right. That's, yeah. So you have kids. You're married. I mean, look, you have a child. That's abandonment to God. <laughs> <laughs> so you 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 know you're you're boasting about the priests, and yeah, there is a certain thing that that Friar had to do. But hey, you're your fathers. You're having children. I mean, there's a lot of unexpected factors with you and your children. So you know you're doing it yourself, just in a different way, abandoning yourself to God and say, I'm trusting that God's going to. Um, uh take care of me and my family um in that but it, the pilgrimage is a sense like okay i'm going to try to increase my abandonment and and the the reality is you don't have to walk this there are there are there are people who do the pilgrimage to saint james tomb in, in northwestern spain uh they fly over they do this by bus I mean, anytime you go on any pilgrimage, even if it's all planned out by one of these tour companies, there's a, there is a sense of abandonment. There is always hardship. There's things that are difficult. Even if you're riding on a bus and traveling with 30 other people, there, there are problems and difficulties with it. So 
uh, I mean, there's different degrees of abandonment to the, these pilgrimages, and and each one of them is a sense like, all right, I'm going to pray and I'm going to let God take control of this pilgrimage. Right. Well, thank you for that, Father, because I think that one of the things that Joe try to ha Joe and I try to hammer on the show as much as we can, mostly for ourselves. I mean, because like you said, you know, we, we have a family. We're 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 both married. We're we're trying to live the sacramental and, and sacrificial life. And like you said, we say all the all the time on the show, Father, you want you want to pick up your cross, like Jesus said to go get married and have kids. It's kind of built into the equation, uh, you know, so so go do that. But we do try to encourage people to, and including ourselves, like I said, not to belabor the point, but they, we need to try to find ways in which we could deepen our spiritual life through through a bit of self-sacrifice. Uh, but anyway, let, let's let's keep the conversation going for those of us, uh, those of you just joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Father Greg Markey's here. We're discussing um, his new book, Discovering the Camino de Santiago. It's available at Sophia Press. We will post the link in the description so that you could go out and buy the book with a discount. Joe Restinello. Father, in the book, you note that you wrote it from the perspective of a believer. Obviously, you're a believer. You're a priest. Um, are there non-Catholics that you encountered on this journey, non-believers that you met along the way that maybe, you know, for whatever reason decided or felt called to make this journey? Yes, absolutely. I, it may be surprising for people to hear it, but actually the majority of the people, I would say, I don't have exact statistics, but I would say in my encounters and conversations with people, the majority of the people are non-practicing Catholics. That's interesting. Uh, are, are not, I, I mean, non-believers. Some of them are non-practicing Catholics, but the majority are are not even Catholic, and and they're doing it. Why are they doing it? They're doing it because a lot of different reasons. They're they're looking for something that's missing in their life. They don't know what it is, but something's missing in their life. Faith in God. They know. I, I don't have. Like one woman said to me, "Father, you have, you believe in something. I wish I had that. I don't believe in anything. I wish I believed in something." Um, there are other people that are just going through a crisis. They maybe have gotten uh, over drug addiction or alcohol addiction, and they're, they're trying to do a new start in life, and they're saying, this is going to help me get a new start in life. Other people, after a death in the family, they don't know what to do, and so they decide, I'm going to go on the Camino Walk It to try to uh, make peace with the death of this person. There's a lot of different reasons why people do it, and, and a lot, and as I said, the majority of the people are not doing it because of their Catholic faith. They're just looking for something, but they don't even know what they're looking for. Um, well, the market, sort of, we always, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's a manifestation of the world today. I mean, the majority of the people are non-believers. And so they're, they're all looking for something, but there's something appealing about this, this pilgrimage that says, well, it's something ancient here. There's something mysterious. So I'll do it. And maybe it'll answer that gnawing question that, that huge, uh, inexpressible question that I have that I don't even know the answer to about why am I here? Why is there suffering in the world? What happens after death? Uh, I don't know the answer to these questions. And so I'm going to do this pilgrimage with hopefully trying to find some kind of answer. Well, Father, let me let me stay there for a second, if you don't mind. What what do you, what in your view as a Catholic priest, Joe and I try to encourage people, obviously, our primary goal and always has been is evangelization. We hope people see us. We're talking as Catholic men. We talk to people in the Catholic world. We try to educate people. We mostly get educated ourselves on these things because Joe and I certainly don't know everything and nor do we pretend to. But in your view, given your travels as a priest, what causes this unbelief? Is this is this unique to the modern world? Is it is it post enlightenment thinking? Is it something that's gone on through all of human history? In your view, that woman you mentioned who says, "Father, I don't I don't believe in anything. I wish I did, but I don't believe in it." What what's the cause of that from your point of view? I think it's the universities and the education system. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I think the entire education system is ordered to it, the, the the education system is started with the first principle is Jesus Christ is not God. We don't know whether he is, he's not. And so that's our first principle. And we can't know that answer that question. And the second thing is, how are you going to make money? And so they don't even discuss the big questions about what does it mean to live the good life? Uh, what happens after death? Why is there suffering in the world? Why am I here? Uh, you're not going to get answered to those questions. And if you do answer those questions, they might be posed in certain books or literature, but you're not going to get any concrete answers to them. And even, unfortunately, many of the Catholic institutions out there are, are not aiding our, our, our youth in, 
in discovering their and learning their Catholic faith. I, I put the, I place the blame pr primarily on the education system. But well, thank you for that, Father. I, 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 we thought you might say that, all right. Mm -hmm. But I didn't. I, I quite. I, but I didn't see it coming. Uh, but they, but that's again. That's a constant. One of the constant things we 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 hammer home. I will agree with you, by the way. That's a source of frustration for me. That when I when I look back and let's just say for for argument's sake, uh, members of my family. Okay, um, some of which went to Catholic school from 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 kindergarten right through uh, right through uh, their bachelor's degree and came out on the other end Buddhist. All right. Or non-believers or atheists. And I say to myself, how does that happen? Uh, so and again, we're not here to pick on Catholic institutions of higher education. But but there's there there might be a little soul searching that needs to go on at, at some of the institutions that do call themselves Catholic, because if that's the result, I mean, I don't. I don't get it, me personally. I mean, you're supposed to be teaching the uh, the gospel alongside of a liberal education, a classic liberal education, um, and a lot many times it doesn't work out that way. Anyway, I don't want to I don't want to go off on a on a tangent. Joe, I mean, well, there's, go ahead, there's a lot of factors. There's a lot of factors that go on here with that as to why people have why we as a, the West have lost the faith. I mean, it's a huge question. I mean, you talk about the Enlightenment. There's a lot of philosophical first principles that are insinuated in the in, in education systems and in our culture and our media. I mean, there's a lot of complicated realities. I don't have a, a single answer to this. I mean, I, we, we were talking about this before, the, the widespread acceptance of, a, of contraception and everything that Paul VI had prophesied in 1968 that would happen if contraception became widespread. Um, that's all come true and even worse beyond anything that Paul VI could have even imagined. Um, that's that's a contributing factor as well. Uh, loss of the sense of the sacred. Um, th there's just no sense of, of God's presence in our lives. Um, uh, so there's a lot of. I mean, I don't have. It, it's complicated, but I think ultimately you have to lay it at the feet of, of the universities and the, and the the education system. And I think it's been. I, I think it's perpetrated. I think it was purposeful. Father, well, I mean, no, just no, to expand on that a little bit, too. I think the West, you talk about Europe, you talk about America, Australia, Canada, we're comfortable. I mean, we're just comfortable. Uh, I look at we could look at the Italian migration to America. We came here very Catholic Italians. If you ever see the movie came out in 1980, Fatso with Dom DeLuise, it's like a famous movie in the film. All on the walls are like crucifixes, saints. Mother Mary is a, yeah. everywhere in the film. That's 1980. Italians are, we come here, we succeed, we become Episcopalian or we don't go to church because we have faith in the refrigerator. We have faith in our money. I mean, I do think that that has a correlation. Families don't rely upon God. When your back's up against the wall, you have no money, you have nothing, you're living in a boarding house. My family came here. My my grandmother had 17 kids. They lived in a boarding house in Newark. My great grandfather delivered ice, delivered ice in the street of New York. He fathered 17 children, 12 lived. They knocked the wall down. The bathroom was in the hall. I mean, I'm not lying. They had faith. My great grandmother, just to go on a rant, named the child Rockina after St. Rocco. Maybe the only Rockina on the globe. Who names a kid Rockina, father? A crazy Italian lady. That's who. I mean, this is because they didn't have anything. But then, you know, like families move on. They move away from the neighborhood. They lose, the, you know, they get fancy cars. They buy a house. They think they've arrived. They don't go to church. <laughs> I mean, this is where America, this is where we get lost. Yeah, that woman I bet you didn't live in a boarding house <laughs> and didn't have a kid named Rockina. That I can guarantee. Yeah, these are all part of the factors, certainly. And the material prosperity has not helped. It's given the illusion of security, again, that we are in control of our, our lives and our events of our lives, and we're not. Um, that's certainly a contributing factor as well. I, I find that like when I think of like something like we're talking about today, like the Camino de Santiago, that's one of the primary things I would think about is maybe a mo like Lent, similar, similar to, to Lent, where you, there is a self-denial, maybe break out of that comfortability, maybe maybe self-imposed to say, I, well, for a month, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Father, it took you a month to do this journey. All right. To complete this journey. It's a month long journey, or uh, I, I believe. Um yes, 
Yeah, to 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 put things down for a month, to to get out of that comfort zone, to remember that what's important is or not the things as as Saint Paul says are not the things that perish, uh, but those things that lead to eternal life. Um, I I, I mean. It, it 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 would seem to me that that's one of the main reasons why I know me personally, why I would want to, if I ever had the opportunity in my life, go on a pilgrimage like this, um, would be to do that, to remind me, uh, maybe maybe we need to break out of some of the comforts we have. Uh, anyway, we have about we have about five minutes before the break, Father. Let me let me go here. You wore your collar through the whole journey, through the whole pilgrimage. Yes. How were you greeted by by your by your fellow pilgrims in general? Overall, with great respect, I still think the collar is is a great sign of uh, God in in the world. I think it's a giant sign that invites people to you. Says, "Come talk to me about God," uh, when you wear the collar. And overall, people showed me on the Camino respect, and they wanted to talk. And the Camino is a place where you have long conversations with people about just walking on a dusty trail. Why are you doing the Camino? What are you looking for? What is your purpose of this? And when you're a priest, there are even more people just have a tendency to open up to you and start telling you about their faith, what they believe in, or why they don't believe. And that's actually where the book is has had some success. This is actually the second printing of the book. Um, the book has had a remarkable amount of success, and I think it's primarily it. The book is basically the story of people from all over telling me their story about why they don't believe what they have against the catholic church or what they what they're looking for in life and as i was having these conversations from people from france from spain from italy from germany from different canada from people all over the world i was writing them down in a journal as i was going along and eventually i published all these stories these conversations with various people and what their hang-ups are with the church and why they're what they're looking for and what their angst is about and um, and some of my responses to him is trying to say, well, you know, have you tried God? Um, and this is actually what the church teaches. That's not what the church teaches. This is actually what the church teaches. It's actually compassionate and it's truthful and it's good. So maybe you ought to reconsider. Um, and I think the book struck a chord with a lot of people because there's just a lot of different random conversations about the faith and where people are at in their lives and where they're struggling with this this idea of believing in Christ and the Catholic faith. Absolutely. Father Markey, we're going to take a quick break here at the front line with Joe and Joe on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network. Uh, if you're just joining us, Father's here to discuss. Uh, do, you said this is a reprint, Father? That's right. This is second printing now. Second printing of Discovering the Camino de Santiago. Uh, it is available at the larger booksellers, but we encourage you to buy it from Sophia Press. We will uh, post a link in the description so that you can go there. You can buy it with a discount, uh, which is always an awesome thing. So Father's with us. We're going to have another great segment with him here discussing uh, this particular pilgrimage. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back, everyone, to the front line with Joe and Joe, Joe Pasillo and Joe Resinello. We are way in the breach on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network. We're discussing Discovering the Camino de Santiago. That is the new book, a reprint uh, out from Sophia Press, written by Father Greg Markey, who's here with us today to discuss this. With that, I'm handing it over to Joe Resinello. Father, I've never, as I said to you earlier, uh, done the Camino, but I've traveled. I've done a lot of backpacking. I've done a backpacking trip in Europe two months. I've been pretty much everywhere like that. And one of the interesting things about those type of trips is people talk to one another. You go to a business trip like to Chicago and you stay at the Peninsula Hotel. Um, no one talks to you. It's a nice hotel. You know, don't get me wrong. You know, fancy bar, fancy food, the whole deal. Uh, no one says a word to you. Not in the hall, not in the elevator. They can care less. You go on a trip like this, you stay at a hostel, you sleep in a room with 30 people, which I have done in my life, um, and people talk to you. You know, you meet all types of people, all types of people. I Tell us a little bit about the people you met. Get into some detail, some interesting people. Um, you know, not even necessarily Catholic people. They could have been just interesting. Their story, somebody that, like, you never would have met. And that's, again, let me just emphasize that. You meet people you never would meet on things like this. And I think that's interesting for anyone who was considering the trip. Yes, and the barriers between 
me as a priest and them are suddenly all broken down because there's such a common denominator like look we're all in this together and i need you to look out for me and me to look out for you so um everybody is is on the same page there and they're helping one another and the first conversation you have with someone is <laughs> how are your feet doing um and that then your your bond with them grows from there um and then the fact that that i was a priest uh, and i was wearing my collar then instantly they say well why are you doing it and and then i would say why are you doing the camino and and we started to talk about their their faith and things um yeah, it was it was a, a lot of interesting conversations, as as I was saying before, from really all the European countries. A lot of people from from as far north as Norway and and Denmark and and people from Ireland and France and Italy and Germany. Uh, it was great. It was wonderful to meet all of them. And in Canada and the United States are well represented as well. Some people from South America and even Japan. Um, uh, yeah, meeting people, talking to people about their their Catholic faith. Um, I, I, you know, I met uh, an Irishman who was uh, a professor. He was an economics professor, and uh, his brother-in-law, with whom he was very close, had died of cancer when he was 50, and he just didn't know what to make of it. And this Irishman was, in many ways, non i mean he was catholic but he was not practicing i heard that again and again especially from the spaniards yo soy católico pero no pro no practicante I'm, I'm catholic but i'm not practicing that was a common uh phrase i heard and uh this irishman was you know he's educated successful death had brought the reality of that he's not in control of everything in his life right before his eyes and he lost this this his brother-in-law with whom he was very close and he was struggling with it. He said, I don't know what to do. And finally he said, I'm just going to go walk the Camino. So he traveled down there and was walking. And he and I walked for two or three days together and talked about a lot of issues. And he had a lot of misrepresentations about the Catholic faith. Um, and as best I could, I, I write about it in the book about the natures of our conversations and going back and forth. And he was educated so he could speak pretty well and argue his points pretty well. Um, and uh but i was trying to make it give him a counterpoint on how to think on these things and maybe the way he thinks about the catholic faith is, is has not been properly formed um so that's a lot of it is is just giving people a better sense of the faith and that's the kind of people you meet on this i want to expand um, on that a little bit because in my experience again i never did the camino but i've done a lot of backpacking trips a lot of trips similar staying in hostels crazy situations staying all over the world is giving people a chance because I'll give you a, for instance, I can remember being in the chapel in Calcutta missionaries of charity a Franciscan is saying confessions and a girl in adoration who has like crazy dreadlocks, piercings, tattoos goes and goes to confession. Like you never, we have, we have preconceived notions of people. You, you, it, it's just human. We don't give people a chance. And you said barriers are broken down on things like this. We should take that idea outside of the pilgrimage, outside of the backpacking trip, to give people a chance, all people, everyone. Sometimes, and I have found this on trips like this, people surprise you. Someone you don't think is going to do something or and or come around does and we should always be like that with people. Um, talk about that, because that's something I've learned on trips like that, is to never write anyone off. Always give them a chance. And many times, those are the people that surprise you. Yeah, it's, an, it's a mysterious reality. There's something to that. I remember I connected quite a bit with people from Sweden and Norway. I don't know why. Their English was good, for one. And um, I walked a number of days with different people from Sweden and Norway, and they were as secular as European seculars could be. But there was something about them that we connected really well. And we had a certain bond and a trust and rapport between us that was um, healthy and, and, and reassuring and, and uh, good, full of goodness. But they didn't believe in God. Um, and I don't think I would ever had long conversations with people like that. And, and eventually, um, I, I was. There were people like that. I remember a young couple that I talked with. They were com from Canada. They were living together, and completely secular, not married, 
both well educated. They've both been to college, and uh, I think they're both working in environmental sciences. And um, we talked, we walked for, together for two or three days at different periods of time, and really developed a confidence. And eventually, we started. They, 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 they I could tell they were, they were treading. They were saying. So I worked a little bit before I entered seminary, and I told them that I said I was I graduated from college too. I worked a bit, and then I entered seminary. And so they're, they're, they're you know, well, if you're working, why did you enter seminary? You know, and, and then they're, they're asking, well, you know, I, I felt that there was something missing in my life. I, I felt like I, I had deeper questions in my life, but I knew they didn't believe in God. So I was trying to phrase it in a way that would make them uh, wouldn't immediately make uh, put them off. And they said, you know, said, well, well, what were you looking for? I said, well, I just realized there was something that the education I received, I've been in public school my whole life, it had not told me about about these questions that we all struggle with. Why am I here? What happens after death? Why is there suffering? And there's got to be some kind of answer. And the greatest wise men of the world had answers to these questions, but I never learned any of those answers to those questions. So I started to read and I started thinking about it. And I started to read the Bible and read the lives of the saints. And um, and, and I could tell I was twe tweaking their instrument, their interests and, and slowly drawing them in. Um, so, you know, people like that, I never would have had a conversation with, but because we were walking on a long dusty road for two or three days on and off, this kind of conversation happened. And at the end, I always carried, I carried a, a pocket full of miraculous medals with me. And at the end of all these conversations, I'd always give them a miraculous medal and say, this is the mother of Jesus. She promises you that if you put this blessed medal around your neck and wear it, you'll receive special graces and protection. So I encourage you to wear it. See, the, the problem is, one of the problems, Father Greg Markey, joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe, is that when, you, when it used to be, in, in our view, uh, we're not going to go too far off the rails, but I, I do want to make this point. And I love your comments. It used to be that that debate was something that was important in Western civilization, even in the even in the modern world. OK, um, let's say, uh, you know, uh, if, if the, you debate metaphysical questions, uh, basic questions like, like you just um, that you just uh, stated. But now we live in a world where if you come from a Western country and you watch somebody, let's say, for argument's sake, like a Richard Dawkins, okay, and I never apologize for beating up on that guy at the front line with Joe and Joe, ever. Now the view is those are metaphysical questions. We don't need metaphysics anymore because we have physics. This is I'm just using that, Father, as an example of, of how people are taught. It used to be that you had to answer these questions because those are questions that occur to all of us because they're first principles. But when you constantly hear from the Christopher Hitchens, who's dead, obviously, or or Sam Harris or or all the, the, the aggressive atheists, well, we don't have to answer those questions. They're not important. When did that happen, Father Markey, where you didn't have to answer even not just religious questions, but even basic metaphysical questions like, why are we here or what's the meaning and purpose of my life? I think that's a contributing factor, a major contributing factor to unbelief in the modern world is this idea that we don't even have to answer these questions anymore. And Joe and I yeah. think that's just wrong. Well, I think you're right. And I, that, that goes back to the point I was making before. Where does that begin? That begins with the education system. The education system is 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 failing in that way. I mean, I mean the same, but I, you know, it's, it's complicated because the primary educators of children are not the parents, the parents of the primary educators of the children. They're the ones responsible for making sure that the faith is transmitted to the children. But unfortunately, we after the baby boomer generation, you had an entire generation of people that had fallen away and they were no longer educating their children in the faith and, and, and relying on the education system to teach them these metaphysical questions or not even asking the metaphysical questions uh, about transcendence and things. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I again, I go back to the education system has, has failed. And um, it's interesting. You're doing a lot of philosophy there, Joe. I'm impressed. Uh, I didn't come on the program to talk about philosophy, but I'm happy to. <laughs> oh, no. Well, well, Father, one thing, one thing Joe and I do all the time, I mean, obviously, we don't want to give away too much of your book because we want <laughs> folks to go out and buy it. Uh, but we do like to take conversations maybe in a natural way. We don't try to force it, but in a natural way to, to ask certain questions, particularly, you know, you're, 
let's face it, you, you're an author, you're a Catholic priest, and Joe and I can learn something from you, and so can our audience. So, um, but we're happy that you don't mind that we go off on these. Uh, oh, I like it. These are things. These are. I mean, look, these are things that everybody's talking about. All these parents out there that are struggling with just how am I going to transmit the faith to my children, and how am I going to protect my my children from so many of these errors that are out there and corrupt ideas that are corrupting people's lives. How do I protect my children from that and keep their innocence intact? Um, these are really good questions. And I, I think that people are struggling with it, but they, I think everybody needs to know look, there's a there's a reason we're in a disaster situation with our culture right now. And, and uh, uh, it, it's these it's these questions are not being asked, nor are they being taught in, in our in our school systems. Well, I think that's where the I think that that's where faithful Catholics come in. And Joe and I say on the show all the time, Father Markey, is that we need to reclaim stolen land. We need to reclaim stolen ground. No, ours is an intellectual tradition and a philosophical tradition alongside of obviously a religious tradition. In other words, we have deep, we have the deepest thinkers in the history of, uh, in the history of mankind. When you think of the, the Augustans and the Aquinas of the world and others. Okay. And yet we've allowed a lot of the argument to be stolen from us when as Catholics, one of the things Joe and I are trying to do, we're trying to force the conversation. No, you have to answer these questions. You can't hide from it. Having said all that, Let's get back to the book. Let's bring it back a little bit. Father Greg Markey's here at the Look, front line this, with Joe this and is Joe. The Camino. This is the Camino. This is what you do when you walk the Camino. <laughs> We're on the Camino right now for an hour. <laughs> the Camino, dis the discovering the Camino de Santiago, also known as the Way of St. James. It's available at Sophia Institute Press. You can click the link in the description so you can go and buy the book with a discount from the publisher, supporting, supporting uh, both the author and the publisher, and the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Racinello. Father, one of the many things I like about this book is you, A, went on this journey with your collar on. Even though it's a religious pilgrimage, you said a lot of the people were secular. Um, you were going outside the walls of the church. This is something that Francis has emphasized, and this is something I think that is absolutely vital this is something joe and i are trying to do we're lay people we, we we sort of like uh we know a little bit about everything but we don't know we're not a mass you know we didn't go to the gregorian but we've done some reading we know a little bit about everything we kind of talk to people and we listen to people like you but that's what you did i think the church has to get outside of itself bringing uncompromised catholic thought uncompromised faith uncompromising period in the public square with charity with love and get out there and that's what we try to do on this show frankly and that's what you did you went there you're a priest i'm a priest i got my collar on here i am i am who i am you like me or you don't i'm not and i like you so we can have a relationship and respect each other and maybe we'll learn something from one another that's what Jesus did. That's what he did. That's what we have to do. That's what you did on this trip. Talk about the need for that because too many people, they're afraid or, or they hide or they don't want to say certain things. No, no, this is our faith. This is what we believe. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to beat you over the head with it, but I'm not going to compromise it. I'm not going to water it down. I'm going to tell you what I believe. Tell me what you believe. Tell me why you believe it. Talk about the church getting outside itself. Yeah, I think that's true. I think there, that we do need to get out there. I think it's a struggle. I mean, there's there's an issue of culture and and preservation of a culture. We, we've we've taken a decisive turning point. It was it been happening gradually for a fair amount of time, where the structure of Christendom has has virtually disappeared. Of course, we had Christendom, which cultivated in its most positive sense a a culture where the values that people shared on the street and in the neighborhoods reinforced belief in Jesus Christ and the sacraments and Our Lady and love of the saints. Um, that has virtually disappeared, but there used to be a structure, as we know, that reinforced that. And so there, there's there's a couple things to think about there. One is Europe still has that entire visible structure, and that's one of the reasons you go on the Camino that's distinction, distinctive than going, than like going on a pilgrimage here in the United States, is when you go on a pilgrimage in Europe, 
you can still see the remains of Christendom. The Europeans put these blinders on. They pretend that Christendom never existed or that Europe, that Christianity wasn't part of the roots of what Europe is. But you walk down the streets in Europe and Catholicism is everywhere. It's on every street corner. It's in every steeple. It's in every restaurant. It's everywhere. And so when you go into a pilgrimage like the Camino de Santiago, you see that that culture and, and the depictions of art. You walk down a street and you see a, on the corner of a building of our of just a random building on the street, a beautiful image of Our Lady holding the baby Jesus. And you're, what's that doing there? You know, that, that's the kind of thing you see when you go on the pilgrimage of the Camino de Santiago and so many great European cities. Um, but that has gone. That, that Christendom has disappeared. And, and, and that's a sad thing in many ways because it made it, it reinforced the faith. Now we have to, we have to, now we have to rediscover the faith in many ways and living it in this culture today. And, and there's like a free market of ideas. Catholicism is just one idea among the many ideas on the marketplace of ideas out there. And so we need to go out there and sell this idea to a certain extent, as, as you were saying, as Christ gave us that mandate at the beginning of, of, uh the gospel at the end of the gospel um but what goes on today in, in particularly i you see this in new england i mean new england is 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 a faith in decline the church is declining and the church is struggling structurally to manage this this giant structure that used to exist in the you know in the mid 20th century we're managing it into decline and for a clergy you have to manage this this declining structure and so much of the time and energy of priests and even bishops, uh, really, and bishops in many ways, are managing this structure which is in decline. And so evangelization is is can be put easily in the back burner because you're so busy with administrative duties and even administrative duties which aren't expanding the God, the church, but it, but it's managing it into decline. So it's it's hard. It's it's a hard reality that we're living through, particularly in New England, but I think it's other parts of the country that's going on too. Um, and in the end, what are we called to do? We're called to go out and evangelize. But then when you evangelize, you need to, the church is going to need at some point to rebuild the structures, rebuild the schools, rebuild the hospitals, rebuild the neighborhoods, so that to live the Catholic faith, is, is, it's, there's an individual ascent to truth, which is necessary. Uh, but you need to live out the faith in community. It was not meant to be lived out as a solitary individual. It's meant to be lived out in community. So on the one hand, we need to evangelize people one person at a time, one soul at a time, but that is not the, the final step. Once people accept the faith, then there needs to be the building of a community up, building a culture up. And that's really the way that the faith gets transmitted is when the culture transmitted because my neighbor holds this. You know, they, I remember reading a story about the faith in Philadelphia in, in the uh, 1950s. You know, when, when Johnny was was misbehaved at the local Catholic school, you know, he'd get hit in the, in the arm by by Sister Mary Catherine and she'd get mad at him. She'd throw him out and then he'd see Officer McCarthy as he walked out and Officer McCarthy would say, what are you doing? I misbehaved. And the officer would whack him on the head and say, go home. You know, you're a bad boy today. And then he'd go home and he'd see his parents and, and the parents would say, what happened? He said, well, Sister Mary Catherine hit me and the police officer hit me because they're both Catholic and they both know that I was a jerk today. You know, you had the, everybody that reinforced the faith. I mean, that's sort of a, a funny example. But I mean, all right. You, it, it just emphasizes the idea that it takes a community um, to, to live the faith, and, and that's what we need to, to, to build up. So, yeah, we need, we're, at, we're at ground zero again. We're at the point where Catholicism is just one more idea, and Christendom is gone, and we need to evangelize one person at a time. But then after that, it's going to be building the school system back up and building the hospitals and care for the poor. And um, and ultimately, then trying to get a hold of the media, so we're doing things like you guys are doing. You guys are doing this, uh, you know, using the media to build up the faith. So God bless you. Well, Father Greg Markey, let me ask you this. I mean, Joe's always talking on the show about getting back to ABCs, getting back to the basics. Pilgrimages have been going on for two thousand years. Okay, um, there's pilgrimages all over the world, not just the, the Camino de Santiago. Um, 
perhaps we perhaps we should be encouraging people hopefully people go out and buy your book and feel inspired to go on a pilgrimage like i said i, I joe i never knew there was a pilgrimage in new jersey to doylestown pennsylvania um but there was and i i, I know that i gained some sort of grace from it um i couldn't tell you what it was but i know it benefited me spiritually in some way to do that Part of it is getting back to basics. Where, What are some other, some people might be listening and saying, well, I can't get to Spain, Father Markey, so what can I do? Yeah. Maybe, to, can you let our audience maybe know where there's some other maybe more well-known pilgrimages that might be a little bit more accessible for them? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think if you look anywhere around your state, your area, I'm not, you, you two are from New Jersey, I'm from Massachusetts, you look around for where... The first one would be, when was the last time you did a pilgrimage to your local cathedral? Do you have any saints or blesseds or venerables in your area? Go and visit their tombs, drive there, uh, make it a day event with the family. Uh, make it so you, you know, we're gonna go and maybe we're gonna walk a mile, park somewhere and walk the last five miles together, or even just driving there and going and praying at the tomb on, on a feast day, you know, on our ladies feast day. Where, where is there a big Marian shrine where you live? Go to go to the local Marian shrine on one of our feast days. We have the the Annunciation coming up just after Easter. You know, go go on the Annunciation. Go go to Marian shrine and pray to Our Lady. Go there and pray a rosary there. Uh, these are things that that create bonds, that keep create memories. And as you're saying, most importantly, it gives grace. We receive grace from these things and it's, it gets us out of our daily routine and our, 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 our daily exercise and gets us to step out of ourselves and, and, and meet some new people. And um, I think these things are, as you say, it's always been part of our Catholic faith to do pilgrimages right from the beginning. And I, I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful practice to start once again for people who haven't been on pilgrimages. When I was a pastor of a parish for many years, I, I led many pilgrimages to different sites sometimes just for a day or sometimes for a few days or sometimes for 10 10 days two weeks and i always found that those people i went on pilgrimage with sometimes 20 30 40 people we had bonds that still we share today because we did that pilgrimage together and we share those memories and um it, i think it helps really build up the body of christ and I, you know i recommend that for priests do you want to build up your parish do a pilgrimage together. Lead a pilgrimage somewhere. You'll you'll you will you will form a foundation in your parish, and they'll get to your people get to know you like they never knew you before after the pilgrimage, and they say, "Oh, I know him. I I, I was on the pilgrimage with him, and we had a great time. We had many meals, and many conversations together. Um, it's it's worth making the sacrifice for." Absolutely, absolutely. Father Greg Markey joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Please go out and buy his book, Discovering the Camino de Santiago. That's available at Sophia Institute Press. Joe Racinello, we have about four minutes left. Time for one more question for Father Markey. Father, when we make a pilgrimage like you just explained, it's sort of like a microcosm of life. I mean, life is a pilgrimage. We are born and we die. And basically, the goal of life is to get to heaven. We journey to Christ. Hopefully we we get real close. So our time in purgatory isn't too long. That's what I'm hoping. I'm trying to do all that work now. Um, I'm doing my best, Father. <laughs> so my point is, that's what the pilgrimage is about. That's life. Kind of juxtapose what you did versus the pilgrimage of life. That that's how we should view our journey to God. We're journeying to God. We're learning every day. We're you know, through the, the ups and downs of life, all of which are put in front of us to get us closer to the Lord. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. That's a great way to end the, the conversation. St. Peter, in his in his epistle, in the, the end of Scripture, speaks about how we are strangers, aliens here on this earth. This is not our homeland, and, and we, we, we should... We, that's the whole point. We're trying to detach ourselves. God is always trying to work in us. And so many things that bother us. Like, Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Well, God's trying to detach you and make you realize this is not the home. This is not the end game here. Our end game is in heaven. And so we're going, we're traveling on pilgrimage right now to our father's house. And this is where we're going. There's that beautiful end of John Paul II's life that he was known to say when he was, he was, fading in and out of consciousness at, at the end of his life and, and when he was dying and, and he was heard to whisper, let me go to my father's house. Very beautiful words. And 
he understood like like no other person understood that life is a pilgrimage to the father's house we're traveling there and like the, the the traveling to a tomb of a saint or to a cathedral there there are great things to be expected when we arrive at that final destination god's mercy god's love god's truth god's wisdom it's all there and we look forward to arriving there because Everything that our hearts desire is going to be satisfied there. We're going to love and we're going to be loved like we've never been loved before. And we, for that reason, will be fully satisfied to look on our Lord. Absolutely. Like you said, Father Marky, that's a great place to end it. Father, one more time, where, uh, the book, where could our folks buy it? And let us know, what do you have going on right now aside from uh, having the, the reprint of this book? I'm a chaplain at Thomas Aquinas College in Northfield, Massachusetts, and a uh, great college. I'm very happy here with a wonderful group of students, great place to study for four years, great books, study St. Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle. Um, that's what I do. I'm just uh, spending time with students and helping them getting ready for life. Right. And as you, as you mentioned earlier, I mean, that is sorely needed. Uh, sorely needed. And, and, and Father, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Aquinas College is, is on the Newman list, correct? That's correct. Yes. Yeah, and we would encourage all of the parents out there with college aged children to look at the Newman list uh, so you could you could send your child to get an authentic Catholic education. Just don't go with the name. Do some research. We would encourage that. Father Greg Markey, needless to say, you are welcome back at the front line with Joe and Joe anytime. It was an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you very much, Joe. Great talking with you and keep up the good work. We're, we're going to try. Please keep us in your prayers, and we'll do the same for you. Thank you all for joining us. Remember, go out to buy the book. Click the link in the description at Sophia Press, Discovering the Camino de Santiago. Father Greg Markey, this is a reprint. Go get it. Read it. If you can, find a pilgrimage near you. Do what Father said. Go to a local shrine. If you could get to Spain, go to Spain. Plan the trip. Uh, it's going to be well worth it. Thanks once again. Remember, um, until the next time uh, that our conversation is your conversation and that conversation is going on everywhere. We'll talk to you soon.